Now, church, we are now, believe it or not, it's crazy, we are four years from the start, over four years from the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Maybe you remember March of 2020, uh, because that was when Millie was born. Nothing else, right? Uh, No, we are over four years away from when the world shut down, from when supply chain shortages and run on essentials like milk and toilet paper happened. Remember that? We are four years away from uh, when we would bring our groceries home and wipe them with Clorox wipes. Uh, We are over four years away from, uh, how do I say this? Um, When the polarization of America became so obvious... And while a lot of things have returned to normal, whatever that means anymore, not everything has. Yes, the economy has largely stabilized. This last week, interest rates dropped for the first time below 7%, thanks be to God. We no longer have people buying baby formula during a shortage and drinking it at home instead of milk. Still can't believe people did that. It's also gross. Um... We can travel, we can eat out at restaurants, we cannot wipe our groceries down and bring before we bring them in the house, all those things. But not everything feels normal, right? Whatever that is. Now, I may be wading into um, some treacherous waters, but this is an election year. Surprise if you didn't know that already. And over the next few months, we are going to be inundated with political messaging and polarizing agendas. Now, I don't know if COVID actually changed anything to actually make us more polarized or if it merely highlighted and entrenched our already politicized landscape. But it feels like things aren't like they used to be in this arena. Now, I want to be clear, I'm I'm not preaching anything political this morning. My message is not political this morning. Well, it is, but it's the politics of the kingdom of God, not the politics of the United States of America. My purpose in talking about politics from the platform right now is merely an illustration for us. An illustration for us to, to show just how polarized we are. How in our society right now, there is, there is a lack of reconciliation. In our culture, there's not much reconciling that happens between people because anymore it feels like American politics is just team sports. You know what I mean by that? This is my team. That's your team. It's like actual policy, actual candidates, actual platforms don't matter anymore. I have my team. I'm going to stick with my team regardless of what they say or do as long as it's against your team. Because I'm a Chiefs fan. I will never root for the Raiders. Okay? I will never root for the Raiders. I don't care. I'm a Chiefs fan. I don't care if they have a better quarterback, which they don't. I don't care if they have better play calling. They can't. Andy Reid, you can't beat Andy Reid's play calls. I don't care if they have a better fan base, which is literally impossible because the Raiders fan base is is nearly as bad as the Steelers. My team is the Chiefs. I'm a Chiefs fan. And I will always be a Chiefs fan, and I don't care. I will never root for the Raiders. I won't. That's our rival. And that's almost how our politics work. It doesn't matter what what they stand for, what they say, what they do. It's my team. I have my team. You have yours. And we're never going to root for the other team. But it's worse than just not agreeing with one another. It's gotten to the point where people will not worship together if they vote for the other party. Where, where people will condemn one another, where they will not spend time together, they cannot be friends together, can't eat a meal together. You know what that does to, an, to a polarized, entrenched society? 
We just get much more polarized and much more entrenched. If we can't eat together, good night. It's kind of game over. It's like we're stuck in the cycle of politics over people. Church, I'm not preaching political today, but I am trying to illustrate that we are a people in need of reconciliation. And not just culturally. I hope you understand what I'm saying here in the church. And that is the point of Paul's message in 2 Corinthians. At this point of Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, he's talking about reconciliation. Now, I read most of chapter 6 just a minute ago. But chapter 6 really only makes sense in light of what Paul said in the previous chapter in chapter 5. In in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we read about Paul's emphasis on what he calls the ministry of reconciliation. He spills quite a bit of ink emphasizing that the church's work in the world, the Corinthian church's work in the world, is to help people be reconciled to God. That is the work. The salvation, Paul says, that we proclaim is reconciliation. The division between heaven and earth, between divinity and humanity, is no longer there like it was before. He's, he writes in the fifth chapter, so if anyone, in Christ, is, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The work of God in Jesus Christ is reconciling the world to himself. That is his salvation. And guess who makes that happen? Guess who accomplishes that? Not us. God does that work. God reconciles the world to himself. But then Paul says there are people who have the responsibility of sharing that message of reconciliation. Whose responsibility is that? Well, that's the church. Here's the thing, church. The work of reconciliation has been completed in Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. The reconciliation, reconciliatory work between heaven and earth is finished in Jesus Christ. We can't make it happen more than it already has. But what isn't finished is the proclamation of that re- reconciliation. What we are to do is to let the world know that God is not holding their trespasses against them. Isn't that good news? I don't know, isn't it good news to hear that your trespasses, the things that you've done that you know are problematic and wrong, are not going to be held against you? It's a good word, church. We are to let the world know that God does not hold their trespasses against them and that God has reconciled himself to them. That is what Paul calls the ministry of reconciliation. And it is quite simply sharing the good news of God's salvation. But that's all in chapter 5. I'm not preaching from chapter 5. I'm preaching from chapter 6. What does Paul say in chapter 6 have to do with what he says in chapter 5? What does what I read earlier in the service have to do with what I just read from chapter 5? Well, everything. Paul has a rather contentious relationship with the Corinthians. There's only twice in this whole letter that he references them as a collective body, Corinthians. One is in the introduction when he greets them. The other is in the reading that I said today, that I read just a moment ago. He addresses them as a collective body. They have not always seen eye eye to eye, the Corinthians, either with Paul or with one another. Paul has not minced words with them, and they have not always appreciated how straight up he is with them. You ever have have that experience where you're quite frank, you're honest, and it's not really received all that well? Or maybe it's the opposite, where somebody's frank with you and you've not received it very well? Paul says, we have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Paul pulls no punches in speaking God's truth to them. 
And in turn, what have they done? They've spread rumors about Paul and his companions. Paul spoke frankly to them, and then they maligned his character. Paul spoke truth to them, and then they gossiped about him. They've denied even knowing him. They have spread rumors that he's dead. And he says, see, we're alive. A little sidebar for those considering a call to ministry or those who've ever worked in ministry. If you don't want your character or your intentions criticized or maligned, don't do it. Just letting you know, I have yet to speak to a pastor who has not had that experience. There is a need for reconciliation, church, but Paul's emphasis to the Corinthians is not to defend or protect himself. Did you catch that in the reading today? He's talking all about this reconciliation, and he does not go to defend himself. Amazingly, Paul is always committed to the gospel. Always committed to the gospel. Throughout these verses, he's constantly emphasizing over and over and over again God's reconciliatory work. Only his emphasis about the rec- is about the reconciliation between himself and the Corinthians. In chapter 5, he's talking about saying that they've received God's grace. This he knows. But then in chapter 6, he says, Do not accept God's grace in vain. Which is kind of a funny phrase if you think about it. What is, how can you accept God's grace in vain? What does that mean? Well, I mean, what's vanity? What is that sink and cabinet and mirror in the bathroom? That's your vanity, right? What do you do at the vanity? You look at yourself. You make yourself look better, right? You clean yourself up. It's a vanity because that's where you make yourselves look good. So then what is the accepting of God's grace in vain? Well, it is accepting God's grace for my own sake. To make myself feel better, to make myself sound better, to make myself look better, to have a better reputation, or even some type of spiritual massaging so I feel real good about myself. Accepting God's grace in vain, using it for selfish purposes when it is intended to be shared with others who are in need of it. Yeah, church, accepting the grace of God in vain is almost like purchasing baby formula during a shortage, not so that you can go give it to a shelter or your church's mother's ministry, not not to make sure that a baby would be fed, but to fill your own belly with it. That is kind of what accepting the grace of God in vain is like. That's vanity. Not offering it to those who desperately need it, especially the most vulnerable among us, but simply using it for selfish purposes. Accepting God's grace in vain is saying, grace for me, not for thee. And this is related to Paul's emphasis on reconciliation because you cannot accept God's grace in vain solely for your own benefit and simultaneously participate in the ministry of reconciliation. Those are incompatible. When you're so focused on yourself, guess who you can't share the good news with? Others. We receive God's grace not so that we can hoard it, but so that we can become administrators of it. Paul said we are ambassadors, administrators, distributors of it. Building on his emphasis in chapter 5, that followers of Jesus are are to participate in the ministry of reconciliation. He really drives this point home when he quotes the prophet Isaiah. He says, he's quoting Isaiah, At an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. And then he responds to the prophet Isaiah by saying, See, look, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. That is what he's saying is reconciliation has come to the world through Jesus Christ. It's now. Why are you waiting to be reconciled with people when God's already done it? Now is the day of salvation. Go and proclaim that reconciliation is happening now. 
at the risk of beating a dead horse, he continues in his emphasis on reconciliation when he tells them that even though they've withheld their affection from him, he has never withheld his affection from them. I have not withheld my affection, but you have. Paul wants reconciliation with the Corinthians, but they apparently won't have it. And here's what's so remarkable about Paul, and maybe there's a word in this for us today, church. When others reject Paul's attempts at reconciliation, what does he do? Does he shut them out? Does he respond to their insults with similar insults? When they malign his character, does he reciprocate by maligning theirs? No, he doesn't. Something we might be so inclined to do because Paul knows that he doesn't answer to the Corinthians. Paul knows that ultimately he answers to God and he knows that other people's behavior will not justify him not being like Christ. You catch that? Paul knows that just because other people are maligning his character does not give him permission to then go and do likewise and reciprocate by maligning, by maligning other people's. Church, listen, living like Christ, choosing to abide by the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, they are not contingent upon how other people treat us. We don't only get to live according to the fruit of the Spirit when other people are doing it to us first. We live this way regardless of what other people say about us and do to us. So this is the foundation of Paul's message. God has called us to the ministry of reconciliation to spread the word that God does not hold people's sin against them, that God has space for them, But we cannot go into this world proclaiming how God has reconciled us to him if we can't even be reconciled to one another. Paul has been trying to reconcile with the Corinthians. He yearns for it. He wants it. By saying he has put no stumbling block in front of them, he's saying, I have left the path perfectly open for us to be reconciled to one another. It is always on the table, but you guys won't have it. Why? In the Corinthian rejection of reconciliation with Paul and reconciliation with one another is a stain on their witness. This is the implication of Paul's message to them. If y'all can't be reconciled with me or yourselves, how on earth do you think that you can go and tell this world that they can be reconciled to God? Church, we are reconciled to God because God extended grace to us. We are reconciled to God because he has forgiven us. Our ministry of reconciliation to this world is to extend God's grace, not to hoard it, not to accept God's grace in vain. Our ministry of reconciliation to this world is to advance God's forgiveness to other people, to not hold grudges. If God's not holding people's trespasses against them, why do we? Because there is no reconciliation without grace. And there is no reconciliation without forgiveness. That's just a word about interpersonal relationships. If you want to know how to be reconciled with people in your life, there has to be forgiveness. There's no reconciliation without forgiveness. If you've ever been married, you know there's no reconciliation without forgiveness. Here's the thing, church. Grace and forgiveness are not simply we pro- things we proclaim to the world around us. They are, as Paul emphasizes, first and foremost, is foremost practices we embody together. A lack of reconciliation and a lack of grace within the church is a hindrance to the work that we have been called to do. How can we be advocates for people in this world to be reconciled to God when Christians won't even be reconciled to one another. Hey, you need to know how much God loves you, but I I can't hang out with this person. They voted for them. A 
a lack of grace and forgiveness among the people who belong to Jesus will hinder our ministry of reconciliation. Our proclamation that God is for people. If we are going to be for our community, church, guess what? We can't be against each other. And I don't just mean that in our congregation. I mean that among the church, capital C. In our in our conversations with Christians of other traditions. Unfortunately, what happens all too frequently when there's a need for reconciliation in the church today is that, well, you know what happens when there's a need for reconciliation? When there's a fallout or hurt feelings or miscommunication or misunderstanding. Do you know what happens? Ooh, the church down the street is starting to look pretty good. I gotta find a new church. I've said it before and I'll say it again. There are legitimate reasons to find a new church. And that's not what I'm addressing. The Corinthians don't have that luxury to say, well, I might just go down the street to that other church. They don't have that luxury because they are a minority community among a people who, guess what, don't love Jesus and don't love the church. So this Corinthian church, they may disagree with each other, they may have the, their issues, but if they love Jesus, guess what? They're stuck. They're stuck with each other. We don't have that situation. We, in our privilege, can just move on to a different congregation and pretend that everything is well and good. We can just pretend like, well, you know, whatever happened there. And, but this is a new start. As if that lack of reconciliation doesn't stay with us in our spirit somehow. The unfortunate truth is that, that not everyone will always receive your offers of reconciliation, as Paul illustrates in this chapter. But that doesn't mean that Paul isn't going to live Christianly with them. That doesn't give Paul carte blanche to dismiss everyone. It doesn't mean he's going to be best friends with them, but he's going to wish the best for them, he's going to pray for them, and he's going to always extend the grace of God to them. You know that grace that he received when he was unworthy and that church is the ministry of reconciliation. It's not a ministry of beating your head against a wall. It's not a ministry of placating toxic people, which is what I think can happen when we talk about reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation is a work that says, while I was a sinner, while I was unworthy, while I could do nothing to rectify my own situation between God and, and humanity, the Father sent His Son to do that which we could not do for ourselves. And the ministry of reconciliation says, I didn't deserve God's justifying work in my life, but good night, I am grateful for it. And if it's available for me, it's available for thee. We don't just tell people that God is reconciled to them through his salvific work. We do, but maybe what's more important than going and telling people about that is that we live out that reconciliation together. How can we be for this world if we're against each other? The best witness of God's work in this world is, the ch is a church that works together on mission. For us, to be, for us to be for our community, we have to be with one another, church. A house divided cannot stand. But a house united in Christ can withstand the onslaught of the most hellish tempest and the darkest night. So let me ask you, church, are we for this world? Let me rephrase that a little bit. Is Christ for this world? Okay, we could say yes to that. Good. Are we, the church, to be Christ's hands and feet in this world? Let me ask it again. Are we for this world? Are we for our world, our community, our people? Well, if we can say yes to that, well, then let's be with one another. Because that's our witness. How can we proclaim to the world that we're for them if we're not for each other? If we're not with each other. Church. That is the ministry of reconciliation. And that is what it means to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to this world. 
is to actually do the hard work of pursuing reconciliation with our sisters and brothers in Christ. And that is the good news for us today.